All right, chapter uh, 12 is going to be about solutions, uh, and we're going to have different uh, concentration units. All right, but it is very important to understand how you make a solution. You make a solution by taking a solute. Can be a, it can be an A. It can be a solid, liquid, or gas. Typical solute is a solid, and then you have a solvent. Again, that could be a solid, liquid, or gas. Uh, the universal solvent is water. So usually in this class, we're going to be dealing with water being the solvent. Then you mix them together and you have the solution. So if this is sodium chloride, salt, and this is water, then you have a sodium chloride solution. All right, so it is very important to understand the solute solvent solution um, idea. Now your, um, if you have two liquids, uh, your solute is going to be the one that's in the smaller amount. All right, so if you have two liquids or you have two gases or you have three gases or you have uh, three liquids, okay, your solute is gonna be the ones in the smaller amount. The solvent is going to be the ones in the larger amount. All right, so that's how you will tell the difference between your solute and your solvent if you have two liquids or two gases or even three liquids or three gases, all right? So when you have more than two, the larger one is the solvent, the remaining are the solutes. You have one solvent, you can have more than one solute. All right, and if you have two liquids, you have two choices. So if you mix acetone and water, uh, you have a miscible, which means it is one solution. So they all have clear, it's a solution, it is mixed together, all right? If you mix water with methylene chloride or water with gasoline, uh, you will not have a miscible, you will have an immiscible, they do not mix. And so you'll see a separation. So there is a line here of separation, all right? And then, and the... Top layer is going to be the layer that has the lower density. And the bottom layer is going to have the higher density. And in the case of methylene chloride, it has a higher density than water. So it's at the bottom, water's at the top. Uh, if we have gasoline and water, the gasoline has a lower density than water. Gasoline would be at the top. If we slowly added gasoline, and you would have to add it slowly if this was gasoline, then it has a, a lower density than water. So this would have, this is like 0.8 grams per milliliter and this is one gram per milliliter, and this is 1.2 grams per milliliter. All right, so you would have to add it slowly because gasoline and methylene chloride would mix. And so then once those two mix up, then you have to get the, the uh, density of that solution to find out where the water would end up. All right, so you have things that mix and they are miscible, and things that do not mix and they are immiscible. And so here we say like dissolves like. And what we mean by that is polar dissolves polar. So if you have a polar compound, it will dissolve a polar compound. If you have nonpolar, that will dissolve nonpolar. All right, so water is polar, gasoline is not polar. They do not mix. Now, if we have oil, oil is also not polar. It will not mix with water, but it will mix with gasoline. So you have your gasoline and water, or your gasoline and oil mixtures. Uh, they do mix. All right, so you need to know what the terms miscible, which means they are going to mix, and immiscible, which means they are not going to mix, and you're going to see uh, separations between the layers. All right, so if we want to know the solute and solvent, uh, if we have two solids like chromium, molybdenum, 
Uh, your smaller amount, that's your solute. Larger amount, that's your solvent. So if you have two of the same solid liquid gas, the one that's the larger amount is your solvent, the lower amount is your solute. Uh, part B is the typical, you have a mass of your magnesium chloride solid dissolved in the universal solvent water. Okay, solvent and solute. Uh, and here you have 39% nitrogen, 41% argon, and the rest is oxygen. Well, 39 and 41 is 80, and so that means the rest, 20%, is oxygen. And so here you got to remember the larger amount is the solvent. All right, you can only have one solvent. The rest of them, the one that's the largest is the solvent, the rest are solutes. And so you have your solute one, you have your solute two. So nitrogen and oxygen are both uh, solutes. All right, so we're going to make solutions, and we're going to have a couple of choices, and then we can make a third choice. All right, so your uh, two choices are either it's going to be saturated. If it is saturated, that means you added too much solid to the liquid. All right, so you will have a solubility. And if you look at uh, NaCl, it has a solubility of 36 grams in 100 grams of water. So that is the solubility of sodium chloride, all right, at 20 or 25 degrees Celsius. Um, and so if we add 30 grams to 30 grams NaCl to 100 grams of water, it will all dissolve. And you have what is called an unsaturated solution. If you add 40 grams to 100 grams of water, you have a saturated solution because only 36 grams will dissolve. The other four grams will be uh, in the solid at the bottom of your beaker. And so it's easy to tell visually if you have a saturated solution because if it's saturated, that means you have solid at the bottom that is not dissolved. And so here they're showing a saturated solution. They're showing that the solid here is at the bottom. All right, and so it has not all dissolved. Uh, note that uh, the ones that have dissolved do not stay dissolved as a, um, as a molecule be becomes a solid, then one becomes a liquid, and it dissolved in the liquid. All right, so one as one precipitates, one dissolves. Uh, and so it's a dynamic equilibrium. It's not static. It's not just all these molecules are solid are going to stay there and all these molecules are in solution are going to stay there. They go back and forth. It is a dynamic equilibrium. But at any given time, if you had 40 grams of sodium chloride and 100 grams of water, four grams would be in the solid form. All right, and so the solubility, uh, that is the amount of solute that is going to dissolve at a given temperature. Again, unsaturated means that it has all dissolved, and saturated means that it did not all dissolve. All right, so here is the example of 30 grams of sodium chloride in 100 mils of water. All right, and so when you add it to the water, it looks just like water. So if you had a beaker of pure water and a beaker of salt water, visually they're gonna look exactly the same if it is unsaturated. If it is saturated by putting 40 grams in 100 mils of water, which is also 100 grams of water, you will visually see the difference. The difference is you're gonna have four grams of solid at the bottom. So it does not look like water. So an unsaturated solution will look when you're talking about sodium chloride, which is colorless when it dissolves, uh, a salt solution and a water, uh, pure water is going to look exactly the same if it's unsaturated. But when it's saturated, 
you're going to have solid at the bottom. So it's easy to find out if your solution is saturated or not. If you got solid at the bottom, it's saturated. If you don't have solid at the bottom, it is unsaturated. All right, so I said there would be a third type, and the third type is super saturated, except you have to make a super saturated solution very carefully. All right, because it's going to contain more dissolved substance than a saturated solution does. All right, so uh, what you're going to have to do if you had your sodium chloride, you heat that up and you can get those four grams to dissolve. And then you cool it slowly so that it stays in solution. All right, and so then you have a super saturated solution. Now it's a very, very unstable solution. As soon as you disturb it, you're going to immediately get the solid to come out. And so here is a visual. This is not sodium chloride. This is probably sodium acetate, uh, where you can dissolve more sodium acetate in water as you heat up the solution, and then you cool it down, and then you disturb it. You touch it with a stirring rod. You add a piece of solid in there. A uh, few ways that you can do it, just bump it. Uh, and you will see the crystals form. And so this is a time-lapse photography, and so over time you are uh, making this uh, saturated solution. So a supersaturated is unsaturated, but as soon as it is disturbed and solid comes out, then you have a saturated solution because you will get more solid is going to come out of the solution because... Uh, it is above its actual solubility. The only way you can get more solute to dissolve is to raise the temperature. All right, and so you're going to make this by having a higher temperature, and you have to then slowly cool that to the 25 degrees Celsius. And again, it's very unstable, and it wants to crash out, and it will. All right. All right, when you mix a solute with a solvent, uh, you can have, well, you have three things. If you do salt water, temperature doesn't change at all. If you take sodium hydroxide as your solute and you put that in water, it becomes extremely hot. All right, and that is, of course, an exothermic solution process. So you just dissolve uh, your sodium hydroxide, which is a drain cleaner. If you put drain cleaner in your tub and you put on the water, it boils hot. It is extremely hot. So that is an exothermic solution process. Uh, if you take ammonium chloride, ammonium nitrate, uh, and you mix it with water, it gets very cold. So that is an endothermic solution process. And so you can have both processes, all three actually. You can get exothermic, endothermic, or no change in temperature as you would get if you dissolve salt in water. All right, so now we're going to talk about gases. All right, and so we have Henry's Law, and it describes the effects of pressure on gas solubility. So uh, if you want to have more gas in your solution, you have to increase the pressure. Basically, you're pushing the gas into the liquid. So you increase the pressure over that liquid, and the gas goes into the liquid. Uh, and we have the equation for Henry's Law, where the solubility is your gas solubility. K sub H is your Hen Henry's Law constant for that gas. And P is the partial pressure of the gas over the solution. All right, and so for a given gas, we know that we have a constant. The constant, Henry's Law constant, when you solve for that, it is the solubility divided by the pressure. So if we just divide both sides by P, we get that this constant is equal to your solubility over your pressure. All right, so we know that if we had a solubility at one pressure, we would get that solubility. 
All right, if we changed the pressure, we would get a different solubility, but the constant is the constant. And so if we change that pressure to P2, then we would have solubility 2. And so the equation that is very useful for Henry's Law problems is S1 over P1 is equal to S2 over P2. Uh, and you can then manipulate this equation any way you want. This is the way I like to put it uh, for your Henry's Law constant pressure, uh, constant uh, pressure solubility questions. So when you have uh, a gas, all right, and you want to push that gas into the liquid, and this is done many times by carbonating uh, various beverages. You got carbonated water, you, well, your sodas are carbonated. All right, so you're going to do that under pressure. You're going to push the piston down, and that is going to push the gas into the liquid. So when you increase the pressure, you increase the solubility of the gas in the liquid. You're basically, you're pushing the gas into the liquid. All right, now note that pressure has no effect on the solubility of solids or liquids in water. It has a huge effect for the solubility of a gas in a liquid. All right, um, so this, of course, is very important if you are a scuba diver. Uh, if you are going and you're going deep into the ocean and you have air to breathe, you have blood, that's your liquid, you're under a lot of pressure, you get a lot of air dissolving into your blood. If you run out of gas at the bottom of the ocean and you're coming up really fast, uh, the gas is going to come out of the liquid, the air is going to come out of the blood, and it's going to make air bubbles. It's called the bends, and it's extremely painful, and people have died from this as well. Uh, and so when you're scuba diving, you always have to come up very slowly to equalize the pressures uh, to make sure that you don't form any air bubbles in your blood. If you do, then they put you in a pressure chamber. They got to repressurize you to redissolve that air in the blood and then release that pressure very slowly. All right, so, uh, so the question, all right, so we have uh, pressure is increased by one atmosphere over every 33 feet. All right, so now we're at 46 atmospheres. All right, so at sea level, one atmosphere, the solubility of helium in blood is 0.94. All right, so now we are going to go um, down 100, 1,500 feet, and the pressure is 46 atmospheres. And so we're talking um, the equation that we had here. Your S1 over P1 is equal to your S2 over P2. All right, and so we have the solubility 1, 0.94 at pressure 1, 1 atmosphere. Now we want to know what solubility 2 is, now that we know that the pressure 2 is 46 atmospheres. And so you would just put in your numbers, 0 0.94, 1 atm, and then the solubility 2, this is in grams per milliliter, at 46. And so you would just multiply the 0.94 by 46. And when you multiply your 0.94 by 46, you get a solubility of 43 grams per milliliter. And so you see that this increase in pressure, all right, we went from one atmosphere to 46 atmospheres. Uh, now your solubility, which is only 0.94 grams that will dissolve in a mill. Uh, now we have 43 grams of that gas that will dissolve in a milliliter of that liquid. So you really increase the solubility of your gas in a liquid when you increase your pressure.
All right, so again, most fish have very difficult time surviving at high elevations. At high elevations, you have low pressure. All right, so low pressure means in the liquid that the fish swim in, water, uh, it's going to have a lot less oxygen. And so they cannot survive with that smaller amount of oxygen. All right, so we have our four concentrations that we are going to need to know. Molarity, we've already done molarity. So this is moles of solute over liters of solution. You should not be putting moles per liter because you need to know it's moles of solute. You need to know it's liters of solution. So the whole word should go with it, not just moles per liter. Uh, a mass percent of solute is going to be your mass of your solute over the mass of solution. And then that says percent, and so you multiply by 100. All right, so that is how you get your mass percent of your solute. Uh, molality, this is molality. This is mole solute. over kilograms of solvent. All right, so it's not kilograms of solution. It is kilograms of just the solvent. So remember, you have your solute plus your solvent. You mix them together to form your solution. You have to know the difference between the solute, the solvent, and the solution. All right, and mole fraction of solute. If we're doing the mole fraction of solute, that is the moles of solute over the moles of solution, but you can't go directly to moles of solution. So you gotta take the moles of solute and add the moles of solvent. In order to get moles of solution, you have to add the moles of solute to the moles of solvent. All right, and note if you have a, a solute and a solvent that your mole fraction, which is a fancy X, that is mole fraction, the mole fraction of your solute plus the mole fraction of your solvent is equal to one. When you do your percentages, your percent all right, percent solute plus percent solvent is 100%. Right, so when you're doing a percent, it's the percentages add up to 100. If you're doing fractions, the fractions add up to 1. All right, so we are going to do a lot of examples of these four types of calculations for concentrations, very important calculations for these concentrations. All right, so here we already went through it. Moles per liter, not good enough. Moles of solute, liter of solution for molarity. All right, mass percent of your solute, that is the mass of solute divided by the mass of solution, or percent, you multiply by 100. All right, so we have an experiment, and we need 36 grams of 5% aqueous solution of potassium bromide. How would you make up such a solution? All right, so we're making up a mass percent, and so we know that the mass of the solute, in this case, potassium bromide, over the mass of the KBr plus the mass of H2O. We know it's water because it says aqueous. Aqueous means it is a water solution. And when we multiply that by 100, we need to get a 5% solution. All right, so there's the 5%. So it calls for 36 grams, 36 grams of an aqueous, of 5% aqueous solution. All right, so we need to have 
36 grams of this solution. The solution is the mass of your KVR plus the mass of water. All right, and so we want it to be a 5%. And so the question is, <clears throat> what is the mass of KVR? All right, and so you just simply solve for x. So we call that the value x. And so you have solve for x over 36 times 100 is equal to 5. Divide both sides by 100. Multiply both sides by 36. And then you have your answer. Ten three point six half six is one point eight. One point eight zero grams KBR if I did the math in my head right. All right, so you would have to add 1.80 grams of KBR. So it says, how would you make up such a solution? Assuming I did the math right in my head. Yeah, okay. Um, so you would have 1.80 grams of KBR, and you would have to add your H2O in order to get a 36.0 grams of solution. All right, and so that means you would have to add 34.20 grams of water in order to get your solution. So how you would make it is right here. You would take 1.80 grams of KBR and you would take 34.2 grams of H2O and you would mix them together. All right, so again, you would take, so I did do my math right, 1.8 grams of KBR. Uh, you would take your 1.8 grams 36 is the total, so that means you have to add 34.2 grams of water to your 1.80 grams of KBR in order to get your 36 grams of solution. All right, molality, we went through that. Mole solute, kilograms of solvent. Solvent, important. All right, so we have iodine dissolves in a variety of organic solvents, methylene chloride, it forms an orange solution. Okay, what is the molality of a solution of five grams of iodine in 30 grams of methylene chloride? All right, so iodine, that is your solute. Methylene chloride, that is your solvent. All right, even if you don't know what it is, five is smaller, that's the solute, 30 is larger, that is the solvent. All right, we wanna find the molality. All right, so we need to find the moles of iodine and take the kilograms of methylene chloride. And that is our answer. So that is the moles of solute, in this case, iodine, over kilograms of solvent, in this case, methylene chloride. All right, and so you have to find the molar mass of I2. I'm gonna just use three sig figs. 127 is iodine times two, and that is a 254 grams per mole. All right, so to find the moles, I have to take my grams, 5.00 grams, and divide by the molar mass, 254 grams per mole. And so that is now my moles of iodine. And then I have to change 30 grams into kilograms, so that is a 0 .0300 kilograms. And then I push the buttons on my calculator, Oh, 
think we're gonna be able to do this. Uh, All right, so I get about 0.67, but that was crazy math. Let's see what the answer is. Oh, 0.657. All right, so you take those numbers and you will get 0.657. All right, so first you got to take your, so what they're doing here is they're taking the mass, dividing by the molar mass. Okay, I just, I had it as 254. Uh, to one decimal is 253.8, all right? And then you had your 30 grams of your solvent, all right? We don't want grams, we want kilograms, and so you got to convert your grams into kilograms. You divide those two numbers, and you get 0.657. All right, mole fraction. All right, you're going to take moles of solute, divide by total moles of solution. There is not a way, the only way to get total moles of solution is moles of solute plus moles solvent. That is how you get moles of solution. You have to add moles of solute to your moles of solvent. All right, and so X, this is more of a fancy chi, not really an X, it is a chi. All right, so we have iodine and methylene chloride again. So they use 253.8 grams per mole for the molar mass. All right, methylene chloride. All right, so we have a solution. We got five grams of iodine. And we have 56.0 grams of methylene chloride. What is the mole fraction of each component in this solution? All right, so let's find the mole fraction of iodine. So to do that, we need the moles of iodine. And then we divide by the moles of iodine plus the moles of methylene chloride. All right, so again, to find the moles of iodine, we take the mass of iodine and divide by the molar mass of iodine. And there's our moles of iodine. To get our moles of methylene chloride, we take the mass of methylene chloride and divide by the molar mass, 35.45 times two, that's 71.9 and 273.92 and 12.01. You've got your 85.93. And that's going to give you your moles of methylene chloride. All right, so your moles of iodine goes in the numerator, and then you add those up, and that goes in the denominator, and there is your mole fraction for your iodine. All right, so there's the answer to that, and there is the answer to that. All right, and so to get your total moles, you simply add those two numbers up, and that is 0.6791. And then to get the mole fraction of iodine, we take the 0 0.01970 divided by the total. To get the mole fraction of your uh, methylene chloride, you take your 0.6594 divided by the total. You don't have to do it that way because you know once you have the mole fraction of iodine, your mole fraction of your CH2Cl2 is equal to 0 0.9710 uh, because when you add those up, it has to equal one. All right, so if you do the math, you will get the 0.971, right, which is what you would get if you said, I know that these two must equal one. So you can do that either way, and that will give you the correct answer.
All right. Bottle of bourbon, 94 proof. That means that it is 40 cent or 47 percent by volume of alcohol and water. All right. So this is by volume, which means you would have uh, 47 milliliters of alcohol for every 53 milliliters of water. So that is a 47% by volume of alcohol in water. All right, and so the alcohol is ethanol. All right, so now it is what is the mole fraction of the ethyl alcohol in bourbon. The density of ethyl alcohol is 0 0.80. All right, and so we have the density of the alcohol of 0 0.80 grams per milliliter. And of course, the density of water is one. All right, and it is definitely, it's one to three sig figs. It is definitely one to two sig figs. And when they're only given 47% to two sig figs, and they only give the density of the ethyl alcohol to two sig figs, we're going to get our answer uh, to two sig figs. So we need the mole fraction of the alcohol. All right, in order to do this, we have to find the moles of the alcohol and divide by the moles of the alcohol plus the moles of water. All right, and so we have the 47 milliliters and they give us the density, which is 0 0.80 grams per milliliter. And so now we have the mass of the alcohol. We have to convert that to moles. They give us the formula. So that is 24.02. This is 6.06. .06, and this is 16. You add up the molar mass. 46.08. And you get moles. That's about 0.81. Yeah, I don't know. I'm doing that in my head. All right, and so then you do the same thing for the water. You got your 53 mils of water, divide by the density, one gram per milliliter. And then you divide by the 18.02 grams per mole. And you're gonna get 0.2. Uh, you're gonna get, I don't know, 2.9. All right, let's see what we get. Oh, they did. All right, so depends on what size sample. Mine are off by a factor. All right, so you get the 0.22 for your ethanol. All right, so let's go back. To my numbers, I get to get the calculator out. All right. They they assumed a one liter sample instead of a, a hundred milliliter sample. All right. So if you take the forty seven times the 0 0.8 divided by 46.08, uh, you get 0 0.782, except I didn't do that right, that is not what you get, you get 47 times 0 0.8 divided by 46.08, that is equal to 0.816, which would be 0.82. Uh, we'll leave the sig figs on here. 
Uh, I'll put in an extra sig fig. It's only going to be two sig figs at the end. Uh, 53 milliliters of water divided by one divided by 18.02. That is 2.94. All right, so here's your moles of your alcohol. Here is your moles of water. All right, and then total moles is 3.76. Well, let's do that 3.757. All right, so when we want the moles of the alcohol, we put in the 0.816 divided by moles total, 3.757. And that gives us 0.2. One seven, but now we'll do the correct sig figs, two sig figs, point two two. And point two uh, point seven eight. All right, so this is the mole fraction of your alcohol, and that is the mole fraction of your water. So point two two is the mole fraction. So they do it a different way, they do a liter sample. Instead of a 100 milliliter sample, I don't know why they're doing it that way. It doesn't matter what size sample that you use, you're going to get the same mole fraction, 0.22. And so now your mole fraction of your water is 0 0.78 because the mole fraction of your solute plus the mole fraction of your solvent is going to equal 1. Uh, you can divide the numbers. You can take your 29.4 here and divide by the 37.6. You will get that same answer. That is not the way I get the mole fraction of the other. I simply subtract from 1. I know that when they add up, they add up to 1. All right, let's do this one last problem. We have a 3.6 little m. Little m means absolutely nothing. You must know what to put. 3.6 moles of calcium chloride per kilogram of water. So you have to be able to go from this little m to moles of the calcium chloride per kilogram of water. All right, and so now we just need the mole fraction. So we need the moles of CaCl2. We already have that. It's right here, 3.6. And then we have to take those moles of CaCl2 and add moles of water. So if you know that, this problem is very simple. All you have to do is put your 3.6 for the moles of calcium chloride and then take your kilogram of water and convert it into moles. And that is 55.5. Moles of water. All right, so if you know what the units are, it's very important to know the units, uh, then this is a very simple problem. If you don't know the units, it's an impossible problem. 3.6 moles of calcium chloride over 3.6 moles calcium chloride plus the 55.5 moles of water. All right, and so you take your 3.6 and divide by that total, and you get a 0 0.0609. We only need two sig figs, 0 0.061. 
And so that is your mole fraction for your CaCl2. And so your mole fraction of the water is 0 0.939. All right, so because they have to add up to 1. And, well, depends on how, if you, well, so anyway, sig figs, I'm not that concerned with sig figs. They rounded that to 0.94. The way I do it, it's a perfect one. So if this is three decimals, then I'm going to give it to three decimals, 0.939. So three decimals, one is perfect, many zeros as you want. So infinite number of decimals minus three decimals, your answer is three decimals. But again, I'm not going to count off for six things there. All right, we will finish chapter 10, 12, 12, probably tomorrow.